Medieval Force Critter Adventures, or shall we say, Paw and Claw Fantasy, is my jam. Like Pretty much that, except worker placement? Everdell is a worker placement and resource conversion game. On your turn, you can do one of three things. You either place a worker on an available location, reaping its rewards, play a card into your city from your hand or the meadow, a sort of auto-refilling communal hand, or recall your workers, which progresses you into the next season, gaining additional workers and offering you a benefit, usually having your production cards produce. Integral to your strategy is management of both card play and the worker placement. The worker locations, a combination of standard spots and more powerful forest locations drawn at setup, typically give or convert resources and cards in some way, which is how you'll typically pay for the cards, which fall into five different suits. Additional worker placement areas or immediate ongoing triggering effects and endgame fat point effects based on what else you put into your city. Once a player completes as much as they can in their fourth season, they pass and their game is done, totaling points from card values, collected coins, scored events, and of course, of the aforementioned fat point cards in your city. Once all players have passed while well in their respective fourth season, points are compared and the most points wins. Sounds simple, right? Well, it is. I mean, everything in Everdale is overall pretty straightforward. You place a worker to get some berries, or maybe you spend some resources in order to put a card into play under your control. Heck, even competing over these events, which are once per game fat points that you can get if you meet the requirements and step on them. For standard events, you just get the right number of suit, then plop down a worker. For special events, just have the right combination of cards and also plop. But what what makes it a curious and such an interesting game is the constraint. I mean, yeah, this game gives you a lot of potential chaining together action after action to become more and more efficient, but most of the resources are going to be used to get cards in your city. But your city only has room for 15 cards, and unless you use special effects, you are stuck with what you played. This means that if you lean into uber efficiency with gobs of resource production, you might not have room left in your city for other high scoring cards. But on the other hand, if you spend all your time focusing on those high point cards, you might not be able to afford everything that you want. It's a simple system, but it's effectively tense. Speaking of cards, another great way that Everdell presents choices and a delightful bit of thematic resonance is the pairing of constructions and critters. All cards, regardless of suit, fall into one or another, but every critter is tied to a specific construction and can be put into play for free if you have their home. Have the palace? Sure, take a free queen. Have the mine? Heck yeah, put in a minor mole. They are usually synergistic and provide a nice optimizational tug. Sure, you had another plan for your turn, but now now that a historian flipped up and you have a clock tower, maybe you'll forego that tasty three wood space you were eyeing. And this hefty deck of critters and their hovels is really what makes the game unique. Diverse effects with incredible illustrations by the mighty Andrew Bosley. Every critter in construction can be found multiple times throughout, so you can play to what's available or gamble on what might come out. With many worker spots on the board based on drawing or even discarding cards at a cost, a strict hand limit of eight that you'll be thinking about way more often than you might initially expect, and the numerous synergies and tactical advantages that can derive from them, these drive every aspect of how you interact with the game, which is going to make or break someone's enjoyment of Everdell. See, unlike many games where you can make long-term strategies based off of what's readily available, Everdell is all about capitalizing on opportunities. Sure, you can expect a reasonable mix of cards to come up, but this is a huge deck, much too huge for you to rigidly stick to a strategy that you were set on from the beginning. Instead, it's all about chaining effects together, tactical decisions and calculated risk about what's available right here, right now. Fortunately, this hefty dose of randomness is the good kind, the kind that empowers you to react to rather than being the subject of, which I like. The other thing about this is that it can be hard to navigate what is a good play, especially for a beginner. Unlike many games of its ilk, there's not much nudging you in a direction from the get-go, especially when there are oodles of good decisions you could make on any given turn. It's an exploratory sandbox, encouraging you to find your own way. I mean, there are going to be some people who find the abundance of choices paralyzing, and others who are going to think that the lack of reliable strategic focus is bland, but personally, I'm way into it. 
It's hard for me not to love Everdale. It combines elements from some of my favorite games. It has the straightforward worker placement and resource conversion of Lords of Waterdeep, the protracted card play and achievements of Terraforming Mars, the brilliant woodland critter theme of Root and the asynchronous round progression, high production values and jaw-dropping Bosley artwork and tapestry, before tapestry was even a thing. Speaking of the visuals, I had to comment on how even the standard edition of the game is cosmetically off the chain. From the odd shaped board to the fantastic resources, the berries are squishy, to the towering tree showpiece. These are all welcome cosmetic curiosities that establish a thematic grandeur, but don't let it fool you. While the game is straightforward and some may argue the cosmetics are overproduced, I think the game owns its setting and proves to be worthy of such a striking pose. It's a game that feels smart and rewarding, but also as welcoming as its pleasant theme. It has a lot of variety through the different events events and four spaces set up and the cards that come up throughout the game, and there's a nice arc as you grow increasingly powerful each season, but feel more and more confined by city slots and few remaining workers to place. Most of all, it's a game that invites you to engage, to chain together actions and scrape the barrel for more resources, more cards, more events, always wishing you could do more, see more combos, play with efficiencies, which just makes me want to play again. So clearly, I really like this game, but is more better? Well, fortunately, science has allowed us to answer that question by taking a look at Pearlbrook, the first expansion to Everdell. The central feature of this expansion are the shiny pearls, which are placed atop four random cards set up at the beginning of the game next to the ambassador frog locations, restricted by possession of suits like the base game events. Merely being the first to go to the location and flip these cards nets you the initial pearl, but the cards then give access to more pearls during this and future placements. The pearls themselves interact with a bevy of new city cards, but also are needed to purchase the aforementioned uber construct and flip adornments, two special cards players are given at the beginning of the game that give both immediate and end game effects. Just a little bit of extra strategic tug to add to the host of good options with limited actions in the increasingly more expansive land of Everdell. Personally, I like the expansion. It does more of what I like most about the game without cluttering things up, but I don't think it's for everyone. The game is fine on its own, and while the pearls and monuments add a new layer of interaction, allowing for more strategic focus and something to do with the late game resources, it ratchets up the level of complexity and woe be to anyone who already found the base game too full of options. But for me, it's got great river art, more critters, cool components, and interesting strategic choices. Oh, and it comes with full sets of extra player pieces and a much needed score pad suspiciously missing from the base game. So if you found Everdell a little too straightforward or you wanted to add some diversity to your game, then yeah, Pearlbrook is great. The only other thing that I wanted to mention before I let you go is that in the base game, there is both a standard edition and a collector's edition. It adds metal coins, wooden occupancy tokens to track when a building was used to purchase a critter for free, some additional city cards, a set of fifth player rat tokens, which the game already feels a little strained at four, but hey, more player tokens are more player tokens. And finally, it adds the legendary cards and this Rugwart A-hole. Each player gets a legendary construction critter at the beginning of the game, which they can purchase or overlay if they have the prerequisite non-legendary version of the card in play. They're dramatic and dope without feeling too powerful. I dig them. On the other hand, this dude straight up sucks. Rugwort has three cards, which can be shuffled into the deck, and they all have really mean, really powerful effects that are super disruptive when they come into play, which really undermines the wonderful nature of the game. Don't play with this dude. He sucks. Yeah, so I've played lots with and without the Collector's Edition stuff, and while I appreciate almost everything that came out of the Collector's Edition, and I feel like the Legendary stuff is enough of an extra strategic layer that it really should have been included in the base game on its own, I still feel that none of the stuff that's in the Collector's Edition fundamentally changes the core experience in the base game, which is that 
it's a really, really good game. One that if you were into empowering games with straightforward worker placement at smog piles of resources with really lavish production, then one that I would really recommend. And that is our review. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.